Amen. All right, we'll call your, your lunch reservation, tell them you're going to be late. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I hope you're in Jonah chapter 2. Uh, last week we kicked off this new series, Don't Be a Jonah. And we're looking at a few things about, about Jonah. We're looking at, um, last week we looked at kind of the idea that, that we can run from God. Jonah was trying to get away from God last week. He was uh, running from God. God called him to something. He didn't want to do it. He went the other direction. So we unpacked that last week, Jonah chapter 1. If you missed it, go back and watch that message on YouTube. Today we're going to look at Jonah chapter 2. And then next week we're going to look at parts of 3 and 4 together. But um, today we're going to look at Jonah chapter 2, so I want you to turn there. But again, a few, a few things about Jonah. It was, it was, you know, he lived somewhere around 700 B.C. The Assyrian Empire was from about 900 B.C. to 600 B.C. It was about a 300-year reign. And um, Jonah was going to Nineveh, one of the major cities, not necessarily the, the biggest or capital city, but it was a major city. And uh, he was supposed to deliver a message, and he ran from God. He didn't like that idea, and so he ran the other direction. And, of course, he ends up on a ship and then thrown overboard and gets swallowed by a fish, a whale, an animal under the water. And so uh, we talked about that last week. But Jonah is um, a big deal. It, it was, you know, in the, in the New Testament, the Pharisees spoke about Jonah, and they, they actually referenced the prophets as a whole. And they said, um, search and look, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. Now, actually, Jonah had. And interestingly, the, the, the prophet Jonah not only came out of there, but more importantly, he was the only prophet whose entire ministry, his mission, was on foreign soil. It's a really interesting thing. All the prophets of Israel were for Israel, but Jonah actually, his ministry was beyond the nation of Israel, and he, his mission was to be sent to Nineveh, which is outside the nation of Israel. They're what you would call Gentiles. And so there's an interesting thing about Jonah that is not just the story of him and the fish. The story of Jonah going beyond the nation of Israel and extending the name of God, the voice of God, and the message of God outside of the nation of Israel to beyond the walls is a it's a it's a foreshadowing it's a type it's it's a it's a representation it's a model of what we eventually see Jesus do through his death and resurrection in Jesus' resurrection, on the backside of his resurrection, which we'll talk about in a few weeks at Easter, we, we see the beginning of the expansion of the gospel out and around the world. That's what's talked about in the book of Acts. But in the Old Testament, Jonah was actually one who was being called by God to go into a foreign nation and tell them to serve God. It's really, Jonah's kind of a big deal. Everybody say, he's a big deal. Look at the person beside you and say, and you're a big deal. Look at the person on the other side and say, I'm not talking about your weight. <laughs> All right. So Jonah's experience is a type of death, burial, and resurrection. And, and, and Jonah was being sent to a, another land outside of his homeland, outside the nation of Israel. Now, in Jonah chapter 2, we're going to read this whole chapter together. This is Jonah's prayer. And all throughout the scriptures, you can read different prayers of different people. But Jonah chapter 2 is a prayer. And I think there are several things here that are instructive for us in how we deal with and approach God, deal with ourselves when we're in the, when we're in the middle of a difficulty. Anybody, anybody ever have, who, who's had children, like teenagers, they've had to discipline? Okay, so how many, of, just because I'm curious, how many of you had teenagers you've never had to discipline? One person. Okay, there actually is somebody. Um, can you just check and see what she's smoking today? I don't <laughs> Ain't no way. Okay. So, um, so here's the thing. The nation of Israel was, um, uh, where does this keep going? Um, Jonah was in the nation of Israel, and he gets sent to Nineveh. He doesn't go. He runs from God. And then he has this moment where he's thrown overboard. And he begins to, to clamor to God about his situation, but not so much in a way that is sort of a, a, a repentance scenario. And when, when we think about repentance, we talk about repentance. Repentance is a, is a, uh, it's, a it's an acknowledgement of our mistake. It's a recognition of our wrong. And it is a declaration and commitment to turn and go in a different direction. It's a, I know I've behaved this way. I know I violated your, your ways, God. I know I've offended you, friend. I know I've done, but, but a repentance, a repentant heart, and the nature of repentance is not just acknowledgement, it's a turning. Now, how many know that turns don't happen 180 degrees in a moment all the time? Sometimes turns take a little while. 
But it's, it's an intentional, willing turning in a different direction. So w- when we read Jonah's prayer, we don't see it quite that way. I remember through the years having to discipline my teenagers. I, I remember having to discipline our kids when they were little. And, and there were times where we had to spank them, of course. So there were also times where we sent them to their room or where they got grounded or where we took, took away their phone or where we followed them around all night in a car. There were times when we had to discipline our kids. And I remember, uh, I don't even know, I couldn't even tell you how many, but lots of times where we would send a child to their room where they would get a spanking, we'd say, stay in your room. And we'd go do our thing. And at, at some point later, it could have been, some, sometimes it was just a few minutes, sometimes it was 15, 20 minutes. There were, there were lots of times where we would suddenly hear a kid saying, Dad, Mom, can I come out now? Anybody ever have a moment like that? Yeah. We had times where we'd be sitting at the kitchen table or the breakfast room table, and, and we'd, you know, discipline, Janelle discipline, or I had discipline one of the kids, and then we're kind of updating the other one. How many of you have those meetings? You know what I mean? Like, come here, come here, come here. Let me tell you about your son. Come here, come here. <laughs> I mean about your daughter. It was never you. It was always the girls. Right. Um, we said, come here. We got to talk about this. And, I, and we'd update her, and we'd be sitting there talking, and it had only been a few minutes. And then you'd hear them kind of down the steps. And you look through the doorway and you kind of see him looking around the corner like. And you're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're supposed to be in your room. Yeah, can I come out now? You're not in it right now. Like, go back to it. <laughs> Let's start with doing what I told you in the first place. Get me out. Jonah's having a get me out moment. Jonah has been running from God, ends up on a boat, thrown over, swallowed by a fish, down in the depths of the water. Now, of course, we don't have any, any clear indication or measurement for how deep he is. What we know is he's, he's in deep trouble, whether he's down deep in the water or not. He's inside the belly of, a, of, a, of an animal, fish, a whale, something huge that could swallow him. And I doubt it was roomy. I doubt he was in there, you know, doing push-ups and trying to training for the next event. Like, it was probably cramped. It was probably gross. It was probably full of all kinds of things you don't want to be in the, in the and, and probably would be unsustainable to even live in that context except for the divine intervention of God. So, so I want you to, as we go into to, to Jonah's prayer here in Jonah 2, I want you to have a context of Jonah's, like, just, just put yourself in there for a moment. A man of God who's run from God, trying to escape the presence of God, can't escape the presence of God, tells the sailors, "Ah, get rid of me and you'll be saved. They throw him overboard. He ends up inside an animal, being sustained to live inside a giant animal, sailing under the water in this animal, swimming around and, and trying to get his bearings on what he's in and where he is and what's to come. Unexplainable. We have a hard time explaining it, and we live a long time after him. But live, live it for a minute. Put yourself in it. And so, so that's Jonah. And then we read this in Jonah chapter 2. And I'm going to read out of the English Standard Version today. Before I start reading, let me give you your, prayer, your, uh, your big idea real quick. Write this down. Prayer moves our perspective from our problem to our provider. Here's your big idea. As we read through Jonah's prayer, I want you to see the, the movement of perspective from problem to provider. Prayer is the process of reframing our perspective from from the problem in front of us to the provider who cares for us. It's It's the moving from a place of saying, I see the problem, to saying the problem is small compared to my provider. That God had provided a fish to rescue him from from the situation on the boat. He may not have seen it that way, but as we ended last week, what we said is, it says God provided, he appointed a fish. So God is our provider, and prayer is the process of moving our perspective from the focus on our problem to the perspective of a focus on our provider. And so for, for many of you, prayer is not, a, is not a practice that you necessarily engage in every single day. I believe that it is, it is the lifeblood of our journey as a believer. To be talking with the Lord every day, throughout the day, regularly, small times, long times, off-site times, in my car. The regular engagement of our communication with God allows us to live in the release of a perspective that has all of our attention on the problem. Look at your spouse real quick and say, don't worry, you're never who I pray about. Go ahead. You're never who I pray about because I never see you as a problem ever. You don't know whether to laugh right now. 
It's the journey of telling God, here's the things I'm dealing with, but the beginning of, of, of moving towards seeing God as larger than. And Jonah walks this journey in chapter two. So let's read it together. This is Jonah chapter two, verse one. It says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. By the way, I spent some time looking at this particular phrase. Prayed to the Lord, his God. It is both Jehovah and Elohim. Both names for God are referenced here. It's, it's both, it's like saying, and he prayed to the God of gods. He prayed to the Lord of lords. He prayed to the God above all gods, who was his own. And what, 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 the reason this is such a big deal is most of the time what we read in the scriptures is, and he prayed to the Lord. And they, and they, they asked God for it was a declaration of the authority of God, but this is, when you, when you see a doubling of something in scripture, it's, it's not only important, it's intended for you to have a magnified importance in your study. And so, so this says, so Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, Jehovah Elohim, the God of all gods, who was his. So there's an emphasis at the start of the recording of Jonah's prayer time that his approaching God was not casual, and it wasn't religious, it was powerful and personal. I'm just telling you, through the course of a lot of years of serving Jesus, there, there are lots of times where I've engaged in prayer that was casual instead of powerful and personal. It was functional, but it was casual. Now, you'd say, Pastor David, so do we have to have this intense moment every time? It's not, it's not, this doesn't say intensity is the thing. It has to do with the, the, the elevation of and recognition of the magnitude of the God we're praying to. Jehovah Elohim, like God of all God, like there is no one like him. Do we see that? And so we see this as, a, as a, the, the, the posture that Jonah has as he begins to pray. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Very similar to, to the way David would write in the Psalms. It says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. So right now, Jonah is declaring what has happened. Jonah is praying and telling God he sees what has taken place. There is, a, there is a recognition in Jonah that his being thrown off the boat, though by the hands of the sailors, was necessary and at the direction of and under the behest of and at the authority of and for the purposes of God. His being thrown off the boat wasn't just because he said, hey, throw me off, because the sailors didn't want to throw him. So in order for him to actually be thrown off the boat, he's acknowledging, Lord, you have orchestrated this difficulty. I am in the belly of the whale. You have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. All and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. So I'm underwater, below the storm. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. Here's the first thing I want you to write down quickly as we look through Jonah chapter two. Never take your eyes off of the Lord even when you're unsure about his eyes. Never take your eyes off of the Lord even when you're unsure about his. Here, here's what Jonah is saying. God, I have gone through this mess and I'm in this situation. You have cast me off the boat. Nevertheless, I will keep my eyes on your holy temple. In other words, I don't like where I'm at and I know that you are sovereign God. And while I'm unsure about what's going on here or why it's going on, I trust who you are more than I trust where I am. Nevertheless, my, I will look to your holy temple. It's interesting because this, this passage, I have been cast out of your sight, is very similar. The same description, same word, same Hebrew word is used in Genesis chapter 3, verse 23, when God creates Adam and Eve in the, in the, in the garden, and then they sin. Eve takes the apple, and then she gives it to the, the man, and he eats. And then they've got this issue with God and God comes, where are you? They go through the whole thing and then the Lord has to send them out of the garden. This is what it says in Genesis 3, verse 23. It says, and he drove out the man. God 
cast the man out of the garden. God drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, there was consequence for behavior and God drove him out. In fact, in the New Testament, we see a similar different word because it's in Greek, but a similar idea when Jesus, after he was baptized, came up out of the water. It says, and the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Jesus went off into the wilderness. We often talk about it like Jesus came up out of the water and said, oh. and the, the dove came down and the Lord said, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. And then Jesus said, hey guys, I'm gonna go on vacation for 40 days and walks off into the wilderness. No, the Holy Spirit drove him. In fact, this is the same language David uses when he petitions God in Psalm 51. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. There is a recognition that there is is a measure of justice and mercy. We'll talk more about this next week. That God effectuates. And there there are times and places. There are functions beyond our understanding. Where God may have to cast us out. Now, don't don't hear what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is that the Lord casts us out of his kingdom, that our our salvation is forfeit, that that we, we, you know, God can get upset and go, punt, you're out. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is there's a clear precedent for the Lord having to keep us from something. The Lord cast Adam out of the garden so he couldn't get to the tree of life. The Lord cast, cast Jonah into the water and accomplished some purposes through his casting him out. David knew that he could be cast out of the presence of the Lord and petitioned the Lord, don't cast me not from your presence, God, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And the, the reason that's so important for us is sometimes we take our, our walk with the Lord so I think innocently and beautifully, God is just, we're, we're forever in the arms of dad. But, but how many know there are times where I had to say, I love you, Dakota, but you stay in your room. You gotta stay over there. I love you, Ashton, but you can't eat with the family tonight. You're missing dinner, go to your room. Did that mean I didn't love her anymore? Of course not. Did it mean, Kelsey, you're not? Actually, we never disciplined Kelsey. Kelsey's been perfect all her life, I don't know. Did it have anything to do with our love? No. Did it have anything to do with not being in the family? No. Did it have everything to do with sovereignly understanding some things that might be necessary in the development, shaping, justice, mercy, retraining of my children? Yep. And so we need to remember that there is not, God is not just sovereign, like the, the earth is under his direction and auspices, but, but to the extent that is true, when we bring it down to some extent personally for a moment, Jonah is recognizing, he's having a moment of recognition here. Oh, oh God, <laughs> Jehovah Elohim, God of all gods, it's you who cast me out. And he's not saying, and you've hurt my feelings. Like, this is such a big deal. So counter our culture right now. God, how dare you get me out? That's not what Jonah's saying. Jonah's saying, I have no business whining or complaining. I tried to run from you, and you have now cast me out. There is some purpose in learning that I must have, because I don't want to be separated from Jehovah Elohim. But Jonah has a transition. Remember what we said, our big idea is to move our prayer is the the, the process of moving our perspective from our problem to our provider. I want you to stay with me here as we keep going. So verse four, then I said, Jonah said, "Then then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. So what what Jonah's describing is this descent into a place from which he cannot be rescued that he can understand. He has been prevented from. I got sent to my room and the door shut behind me and there is no escape for me. And then he says this, and look at the the change in in, um, time. He says, I went down to the land whose bars closed 
upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. Now he's underwater. He's down in the, in, the, in the ocean in an animal, and he says, yet you brought me up from the pit. He is not out of the pit, but he's declaring his rescue in the past tense. Uh, y- y'all are missing this. He's not saying, God, I was taken down into the waters and, and hidden behind the bars of the earth. Yet, God, will you bring me up out of the pit? There's no petition, there is a declaration of a finished and accomplished rescue. His prayer is not, God, I'm I'm down here buried, will you bring me up? No, 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 he says, I'm down here, the bars have closed up on me, yet you brought up my life from the pit, oh Lord my God. I am declaring now, in the middle of three days of nothingness, that my life is rescued as an accomplished act, not a petition telling you you need to see this because our prayer life is usually hopeful wishes god i'm just praying will you give me this job god i really want to marry her god will you god i'm I'm asking you to i'm not saying those are bad things i'm saying we have a like he's been in the belly three days already this is not as soon as he swallowed oh god 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 get me out (laughs) been there three days What's been going on, I don't know. But he has he he cast his eyes back on the Lord, keeping his eyes on the Lord, not on his problem. And he begins to transition from the prayers of recognition of the problem, not, not actually his own repentance, that's a whole other thing, but moves, transitions in this, this verse to a place of declaring an outcome as it's already been accomplished. Here's what I want you to write down. Declare the Lord's completed work and answered prayer. Don't just declare what you want to happen. Declare and speak in faith of things that are not as though they were. Oh man, y'all are missing it today. That one hour of sleep has cost you some energy today. James tells us, right, that faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. We are to declare things that are not as though they were. And that's what Jonah is doing for us here in verse 6. Yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Now, interestingly, this word pit is a, is a Hebrew word. It's the word shachath, and it means corruption, destruction, pit, or grave. It doesn't just mean pit. It's the same word that David used when he said, redeem my life from the pit. Like, we see it throughout the scriptures, but here, it's translated pit, but it could equally be translated grave. And so when Jesus in the New Testament says, I will give you the sign of Jonah, what he is saying is Jonah recognized that where he is is as good as dead. He should be dead. He would be recognized as death, and yet he doesn't remain in a grave. And so Jonah, of course, prays this prayer and begins to declare what God has already done before it is accomplished. Verse seven, when my life was fainting away, was fainting away, you've been in the belly of an animal for three days. It was fainting away three days ago. Three days ago when the animal swallowed you, your life was fainting away. You're three days into this. The fact that you're alive is miraculous all by itself. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope and steadfast love. Another translation says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Write this down. In our prayer, if we're gonna move our perspective from our problem to our provider, we have to declare what God has accomplished as if it's done already. God, you have brought my life up and rescued me from the grave. And then we also have to remind ourselves of the character of the living God. Now remember, Jonah has in, is in the middle of a, of a difficult situation. He's an Israelite. He serves the living God. We know he serves the Lord, and we know the Lord Jehovah Elohim is his God. But he's called to go to Nineveh, which is a, an empire full of idol worship. He gets on a boat with sailors who we hear and read in Jonah 1 that he actually, that they all pray to their own gods. So Jonah is serving the living God in the middle of a place with false idol worshipers on the boat, idol worshipers he was sent to. This is, he is not speaking uh, symbolically. He is declaring the difference and distinction of the living God versus dead gods. 
idols versus the living God. And he says, when you worship, those who regard worthless idols, and he's, I, I think he is preparing himself for the return of what the Lord brings to him in Jonah 3. He doesn't know that's coming. He doesn't know what's about to happen. We get to read the whole story. But he's saying, forsake their own mercy. He's recognizing what he needs from God in the middle of a recognition that he doesn't want anyone but Israelites to receive it from God. There's a tension he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because the Ninevites don't worship God. They worship false gods. And he would be bringing a message of mercy. We'll talk about that. And so he declares in the whale, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. How many times do we spend our time praying, reminding ourselves of the power of our problem instead of the character of our provider? How many times do we spend in our prayer? Jonah could have been sitting in the way. We could have a recorded prayer as, you know, Lord, this whale is big. My space is tight. It smells bad. There's fish bones. And he, he lists a few things. He says, my, there's seaweed wrapped around me. I'm being taken down to the roots of the mountains, way deep below water. And then he begins to talk about God again. He moves his perspective from the context of his problem to the character of his provider. If I keep my eyes on my problem, I'll live in anguish and difficulty. And more importantly, the God who is Elohim, Jehovah Elohim, the God of all gods, may not be able to rescue me. I mean, he doesn't say it that way, but you get the sense that's what's going on in him. If all I do is look at the difficulty of my situation, I'll end up dissolved and, and digested by this whale. I better get my eyes off of my problem and onto the power of the living God. I better remind myself of the character of the one whom I serve. I better remind myself that I need mercy from God because where I am, I can't solve my problem. Listen to me. Very rarely can we solve our big problems. We like to think we can, but very rarely can we. And we get too busy telling God the scope of our problem instead of reminding ourselves of the character of the God who is providing the solution. And Jonah leans into this. In Romans chapter two, I love the way this is written. It says, it says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? And then he says this, doesn't this mean anything to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Can't you see that the, the nature of how God relates to us, and even when it's something like, oh my gosh, Jonah's in the middle of a whale, is intended to help you turn? The reason that I put my kids in their room and shut the door and said, don't come out until after dinner, no dinner for you tonight, was not because I'm not loving and kind and gentle and gracious and providing to my kids. It's because I'm trying to help them change from the direction, the decisions and the sinfulness of their behavior and make a different decision and go in a different direction. The kindness and goodness of God is what leads men to repentance. We read the story of Jonah, and if you, don't, if you don't read it carefully, you'll end up going, man, I can't believe God threw him in the water. No, the kindness of God is what leads men to repentance. The kindness of God is what wants Nineveh to hear the message of their wickedness in hopes that they repent. We'll talk about that next week. It wasn't, it wasn't because God was a big, mean, evil, sovereign God who just wanted to punish Jonah. No, 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 no. The character of God is kind and gentle and merciful and just. We gotta get our eyes off the problem and get it onto the provider. And Jonah has a moment of remembering the deep mercies of Jehovah Elohim. He, his, it's the God he needs. It's the mercy of God that he needed and wanted. And in a moment is recognizing, man, this is a distinctive between the living God and a dead God. A dead God is a punishing God. A dead God is a consequential God. It promises something it can never deliver. And Jonah's having a moment of recognition. Now, I love, I love the way this prayer ends because Jonah kind of walks through a, a transference of I've been in here for three days, things are awful. I begin to, to turn again to the Lord. I don't know if it took him three days to kind of get it. Like, you stuck. Like, was he kicking at the belly for a while? Like, trying to rip it up? Like, oh, I lost my knife. I could cut my way. Like, was he struggling to solve his own problem for three days? Why did it take him three days? How many of you would say, if you were swallowed by a giant mammal in water, you would wait three days to start praying? None of us would. I'd be praying before I got swallowed. I see the mouth open. Oh God, oh God, rescue me. Oh God, I'm sorry. I repent. God, save me. Three days. And Jonah's prayer wraps up with uh, this interesting couple of verses. 
Verse seven, we read it. When my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Verse eight, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Verse nine, but I will with the voice of thanksgiving sacrifice to you. I will with a voice of thanksgiving sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay, salvation belongs to the Lord. And here's, and of course, then verse 10, which is, you know, we love this. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. Write this down. Celebrate what it costs you to follow Jesus. Can I tell you, there, there is a, um, I don't know if it's a pandemic. It is, it, is, it is epidemic. It is problematic. It is a cultural normative to want to only talk about our gathering, not our sacrifice. I'm not suggesting celebrate sacrifice for your own glory's sake. But, but what Jonah is, is, is declaring is that he, and if you go and read the, 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 the original language, it says, with shouts of grateful praise will I sacrifice to you. The word sacrifice doesn't just mean I'll say yes to what you want, God. It actually means I will offer things that cost me something to you. I will sacrifice. I will buy a sacrifice and take it to the altar. I will take an animal and sacrifice it. It will cost me something to live as a person of God and I can't wait to celebrate it with thanksgiving. In my mouth will be thanksgiving that it costs me to follow you, God. And I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, this, this is a declaration that is powerful because he's coming to the end and he may not even know he's about to get, you know, be a part of the vomit system. But he's coming to the end of this three days. And what he's saying, I think, is he's looking on this three days of, of loss and saying, I'm gonna tell the story of what God has done for salvation belongs to the Lord. I'm not gonna end up out of my mess because I'm clever and can get out of it. I'm not gonna get out of my bedroom because I snuck around the corner and said, can I come out now? I'm going to celebrate what it's cost me to follow you, Lord. When I go to the temple and it costs me something, I'm going to tell people, not for my glory's sake, but because salvation comes from the Lord. Man, it doesn't matter whatever it costs me to lift up and honor the name of Jesus, to lift up the, the heavenly Father, to elevate Jehovah Elohim. Whatever it costs me is worth being thankful for and celebrating with praise because if it doesn't cost me something, I don't know that my thanksgiving and worship is all that significant. David talked about that when he was building the temple. I will not, I, not, I will not build you something, Lord, that costs me nothing. And Jonah declares it too. He says, I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. It will be my honor and joy to sacrifice, to give up something, to, to, to lose something because I serve the God from whom salvation comes. And when was the last time you celebrated what it cost you to follow Jesus? <laughs> when was the last time you in your prayer time or in your conversation with your spouse or, or with a friend who's asking you about your walk with God have said, you know what, I, I, I love and serve and follow Jesus. And man, it cost me some friendships. But it doesn't matter to me. I'm thankful I get to serve and be in relationship with Jehovah Elohim. The God of all God. Yeah, it cost me a little bit to, to work in ministry. It cost me a little bit to, with my family. It cost me a little bit. It's not simple and easy. It doesn't feel good all the time. It's not comfortable in every conversation. But I will celebrate with thanksgiving the sacrifice that I give to you, God. I've lost some things. I've had to give up some things. Jonah, you, me. But the voice of thanksgiving because the Lord I serve is the source of my salvation. And he gets everything and he deserves all of it. And so my sacrifice is small. His salvation is everything. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes to set your notes aside? Let's pray together today. I believe that out of our time today, that God is gonna reframe the way you approach him believe that your prayer time with him tonight or tomorrow morning is going to have a, a, a fresh perspective that God wants to know our problems. He just doesn't want to let them have the authority in our declaration. Jonah moves from a place of seeing the problem to a place of seeing an already accomplished answer to prayer. Jonah never repents for running from God, 
but he gets his perspective back to a place where salvation is from the Lord. It's not from me. And I need to remember the majesty of God. Lord, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the testimony and the story of Jonah's life. We thank you for the, 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 the words of his prayer. We thank you that, that he, was, he wanted to be out, but God, the journey of his eyes turning from what was around him to seeing almost with eyes of the supernatural, the completed work that you would bring to pass just a few minutes or, or hours later when he brought him up out of the water and vomited him up on dry land, God. You brought him out of the grave. And Lord, like Jonah, we just want you to know, God, that you are the author of salvation. You are the one who is our rescuer. You are almighty and powerful. You are great and mighty. You are well capable. You have not taken your eye off of us. Your mercies are new every day. Your love is everlasting. You are always present. All of your promises are yea and amen. And God, we get our eyes off of the hardship and the heartache and the difficulty and the depth. And we return our eyes to you. And today, God, wherever we are, wherever you are in this room, just begin to tell him. Lift your hands to him and say, God, I just declare the finished work of the rescue of my child. I declare right now the rescue of my marriage. I declare right now the finished work of my healing in my body. Whatever it is, Lord, I just, I release it to you. Salvation comes from you. We honor you today for who you are, Jehovah Elohim, the God from whom salvation comes. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I, I would just say that there are some of you who don't yet know him. And I want to count to three. And if you've never surrendered to Jesus, I want you to put your hand up real high. And we're going to pray with you a declaration of surrender. Jonah already knew it, but he had to return to it at the end. And maybe for you, you've never known the God who, whom salvation comes from. And today we want to help you take that step. So if that's you right now on the count of three, put your hand up real high. One, two, three. Say, Pastor David, I want to know Jesus. I want to surrender to him. Thank you. I want to call him my Lord and my Savior. Put my life in his hands. If you're online, you can go ahead and just put your hand up kind of in the chat there. Put an emoji or type it in as you make a decision for Jesus today. Church, wherever you're at, online or in the room, can we pray with all those who've raised their hands real loud? Everybody say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for sending him, that he died for me, and for raising him back to life. Today, God, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin. Would you make me new because of Jesus? And today, Jesus, I surrender to you. I call you my Lord and my Savior. It's in your name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, let's celebrate those who just made that decision.